So let's talk about, you haven't really produced anything since Transamerica. Yes, I have. Like what? Three kids. You think that Transamerica was a challenge or hard? You try raising three kids. You try being me right now with three adolescents, alone in the house with three adolescents. I basically duck and cover and uh, most, and, and then occasionally have to confront them and lay down the law. And then I'm really machine gunned. Welcome to Deep Dive with me, Sean Fettig. I'm a political scientist, and I'm interested in how our government and our politicians influence our lives, but also how our personal stories influence our politics. In this podcast, I often focus on topics in the news, but this is not punditry. Instead, I dive deep into issues and stories with my guests, behind the headlines, beyond the basic narrative that is often crafted by the media and our politicians, to help us better understand each other and why we think and feel the ways we do. Welcome to a special Pride Month week, I suppose, here at Deep Dive. In recognition and solidarity, I'm giving you two episodes this week, both queer-themed. Today's episode, and then another this Friday on the pod's regularly scheduled release date, which I know is technically one day past the end of the month, but in keeping with Pride spirit, I'm pushing boundaries. In 2005, Transamerica came out, a movie that defied genres and introduced the world to the character of Brie, a trans woman who, on the cusp of her vaginoplasty operation, is contacted by a 17-year-old son from a previous relationship, a son she didn't know she had and who is also unaware of who she is. The movie is a journey of their past and future, a movie about relationships, parenting, and redemption, as they road trip across the country together. In many ways, Transamerica broke new ground in queer filmmaking, maybe most significantly because this movie didn't kill its main queer character in the end. Transamerica stars Felicity Huffman in her first leading movie role and includes an original song written by Dolly Parton. And the movie went on to win an incredible amount of awards. Some of them include winning at Berlin International Film Festival, Deauville Film Festival, Tribeca, San Diego Film Festival, also a Golden Globe for Felicity's performance as Brie, and an award for Outstanding Film at the GLAAD Media Awards, and Best First Screenplay and Best Female Lead at the Independent Spirit Awards. In addition, Transamerica received two Academy Award nominations, one for Best Actress, again Felicity Huffman, and one for Best Original Song for Dolly Parton's Travelin' Through. This is made all the more fantastic by the fact that this movie was written and directed by a first-time filmmaker, Duncan Tucker, and that's who I'm talking to today. We discuss the filmmaking process, including writing and financing, casting, directing, and promoting the film, as well as some of the magic that conspired to turn such an unlikely film into such a powerhouse, attracting amazing talent and racking up so many accolades. He has some great stories about the industry and also about people related to the project. Dolly Parton, Felicity Huffman, and even Harvey Weinstein. Bette Midler and Cher show up too. We also talk about why he hasn't produced any films since Transamerica, what he's been doing instead, and what he has planned for the future. Okay, let's do a deep dive. Duncan Tucker, thanks for being here. How are you? I'm... Pretty well. A little, little tired. I took a long walk in East London today along the river and the, these cool old canals that are now ornamental for walking and, and cafes that used to be the canals with drawbridges. They're uh, geometrical, 90 degree kind of things that were, were let in old sailing ships for coming and docking and unloading their cargo and then leaving again. It rem- lets you know how busy a port London was w- with the when it was part of the empire, you know, it's just like humongous, uh, areas of docking, uh, crazy. You know, what struck me in, uh, preparing for this episode is we've known each other almost eight years now, and I can't remember us ever having a substantive conversation about Transamerica. Well, let's remedy that. <laughs> okay. It's funny, I took out that long walk today with a new friend of mine who's a really cool uh, mom of another kid at school, a new kid. And the kid is wonderful, just great kid. Anyway, um, 
and she uh, watched Transamerica this morning, which I didn't ask her to do, but uh, she she liked it a lot, and it was very sweet. She had a lot of questions, and I thought said, "You're prepping me for this uh, podcast thing." So she said she laughed and laughed and laughed, but she was also made it sad, and she liked the ending because it didn't tie everything up in a string, but it left you uh, with strings, but it also left you kn- kind of knowing or feeling where it was going, but you didn't know how it was going to get there. But it was, uh, I don't know, please her European sensibility. What kind of questions did she have? Good ones. <laughs> <laughs> um, um, she was like, wow, Felicity should have won the Oscar. When I saw it, I thought she, that's an Oscar performance. I, I don't follow the Oscars. I looked it up. I couldn't believe she didn't. And that was one. And then she, we talked about Oscar politics and shit like that. And then, uh, but that's not really interesting. And then we, you know what? Interestingly, she said, she, she focused on what you said. She said, I love the soundtrack so much. Where did you, the songs were just like perfect. And it's not what I expected, but it was like exactly right. It was, uh, um, so she really liked the soundtrack and I don't know, we didn't talk much more than that about it. Yeah. That soundtrack. I mean, we're definitely going to talk about it, but first, I don't know when you started writing the screenplay, but when you started making the movie was maybe 18 years ago. And that was a different era in many ways, but you know, specifically in queer politics and queer cinema. And I imagine there had to have been some kind of risk in making a movie like this. I mean, it's not like Hollywood was clamoring for a movie with this kind of subject matter, as far as I know. So was this on your mind when you were writing and filming? Did you think this would be a movie that would you know, end up as it did breaking barriers that you know, it would win so many accolades and awards or were you just committed to the story and just trying, you know, to make a movie full stop. And if it's never really seen, so be it. You know, I really didn't think about the commercial aspects of it. I just wanted to tell a story that moved and delighted me. And I feel like an outsider and my heart's always gone out to outsiders from childhood on. I was an outsider then, but also the nerdy boys or the overweight girls who wore glasses as thick as bottles and other mean, horrible kids made fun of them. I just, my heart always went out to them. And when I was, you know, when I was young, I, as a young queer kid, I would look at my mother's nightgowns with fascination and I would run through the halls with my robe and look at it flow behind me like Lawrence of Arabia. So Who's to say that in a different world that there wouldn't have been some trans explorations for me and I might have landed in a different place of identity? I, I think that there's a lot of attention paid to identity, gender identity, sexual identity as though it's a fixed thing. But I think some of us are more fluid or can make certain choices and maybe choose again other times in our life, lives. And uh, some people can't and, that's, and don't. And that's, it's all okay. But, uh, um, you know, who's to say I wouldn't, wouldn't have, have had it, have been trans or had some kind of, uh, uh, gender queer or non-binary, uh, choice in my life. You know, those concepts didn't really exist back then. What I do remember is carrying forward from my heart going to the outsiders when I was a young student in New York coming out of the closet and I went to some gay bars. At that time, it was uncool for gay people to be femme or in drag or to be trans. We didn't even know, uh, you know, trans wasn't really very common or in, in, the, in the world. And there was a, probably a trans woman, I don't know how she would have identified, named, named Lucy, who was occasionally led into the little neighborhood young person bar that I went to and occasionally not because she was in dra- drag or as dressing as a woman, whatever her story was. And, uh, and they thought that was uncool. And when she did was in, she'd drink by herself. And I just, she was so sad and so lonely. I would occasionally send her a drink. I would see her at 3 a.m. at the all night coffee shop and sitting by herself eating. And, you know, I would send her a dessert. I, I didn't really, I wasn't enough to, I was so young. I didn't know to go up. She was older. I didn't know to go up and talk to her, but you know, she was in my mind and heart when I, I just thought, oh my God. And I, and, but I always wanted to step ahead and not paint trans, a trans character as a victim or of society. Like, you know, movies like Boys Don't Cry or Break, 
Brokeback Mountain take the queer person and turn them into somebody who society kills, right? From their cruel misunderstanding or not uh, non-acceptance. But I wanted to make them, you know, the hero of a story going forward in their own lives. And it wasn't about the angst of, am I trans? What should I do? Am I gay? What should I, am I queer? What should I do? What, what's my angsty journey? I just want, you know, my character knows who she is and something else happens. It's about family and, and opening your heart. I'm going to gab on because it's funny because this friend I walked with today was talking about Call Me By Your Name and saying how she thought they were similar. And I said, how so? And she said, just in terms of the theme, like in the end of Call Me By Your Name, his heart is broken, but and he's just a kid, but he his father gives him this advice to just keep your heart open no matter what, to feel the joy and the pain or else you lose both. And she said, your character, she's older and her heart's been broken a lot of times uh, by life. But it's a story about how she has to tear down the walls around her house and around her heart, sorry, and keep it open. And, you know, for pain or for joy, she has to keep it open. So there was something in the heart that's similar between the two. And, and I, you know, yeah, you got a point. You know, I rewatched the movie again recently, and I picked up on things that I don't think I would have if I didn't know you. And it makes me wonder how much some things or, or, or themes in the movie track with your own personal experiences. I'm talking about things like the mood of the film, with which I interpreted as melancholic. You know, sweet and funny at times, but with an underlying melancholy. And I, I, I think I would describe you, and I hope you're not offended by this, in some small part as being the same. But I guess I'm wondering if I'm, you know, maybe trying to draw a comparison here out of something that was ultimately created out of whole new cloth. You know, I have to say, it's funny. I think that a lot of people... You say it's melancholic. I think mm -hmm. people bring their own experience to the movie and and decide what it is. W.H. Auden said the more ways in which a work of art can be interpreted, perhaps the better that work of art is. And I, the woman I walked with today said that she thought it was hilarious. She couldn't stop laughing all the way through. Mm -hmm. She felt for it. And she said she cried a few times, but she said it was just so joyful. And so life affirming in the end, because, you know, she, so you took melancholy from it. She took joyfulness from it mm -hmm. during the festival circuit. When I was going around to all these festivals, courtesy of Harvey Weinstein for uh, the mm -hmm. publicity's sake. And it was fun um, all over the country. I would be in audiences that were laughing so hard that you could not hear the dialogue. I mean, festivals are a nice place to show a movie. And then once I was at a festival where the audience was, dead silent for the entire thing. And I had tried to provide some laughs early on to let people know it was okay to laugh in this movie, but they were dead silent for the whole thing. And I thought, well, that was like the worst screening ever. And after it was over, I was, it was at Woodstock actually. And I was uh, going to drive back and the director of the festival, I was saying goodbye to her. And, and she said, no, you can't leave. And I said, why not? And she said, well, the closing ceremonies tonight. And I said, yeah, well, I, it's okay. I'm, but I just have to get back. I don't, I don't really need to be there. Do I? And she said, no, no, you have to stay. And I'm like, why? why? And she said, ah, I'm not supposed to tell you this, but your film won the audience award for best film. And I'm like, I thought the audience hated it. <laughs> <laughs> but you just, I love that some people, one of the most common questions I got from interviewers after it was made was, is it a comedy or a drama? Mm. Like, hello. <laughs> it's like, that's what life is. Yes. The answer is yes. <laughs> um, so it has this melancholic side, and but I think it's a story about someone who's going to survive and come out victorious and through sheer determination and willpower, you know, she's, she's, she's going to find her, her, her life and build it. And the same with the kid. You know, the summary of Transamerica is often that this is the story of a woman, Brie, and her evolution. And I think what maybe gets lost in that is that this is also Tobu's story and his evolution. And, you know, as a story about relationships, especially those with secrets and, and shame, maybe, and loss and yearning, it, even, you know, when we laugh, they can feel tragic. Do you consider either of these characters, uh, Brie or Toby, to be tragic figures? Not at all. I mean, everybody, a tragedy... Ends usually in a death, whether it's Brokeback Mountain, which truly was a tragedy, or a ha Hamlet. And you, it takes you to heights. But 
this is a comedy. I mean, it's in the end of a comedy, people come together, whether it's a wedding or a family. That's the definition of a comedy. I think probably Aristotelian. I don't think they're tragic at all. Huh. It reminds me of uh, the way I read that Tennessee Williams saw Blanche Dubois when he was, uh, I think it was, it, there was a, I read that there was a production, uh, maybe it was the French production or some, maybe it was the British production, but the actress was talking to him and saying, well, how do I play it when she's dragged off to the madhouse? Mm -hmm. uh, is she broken? Is she, you know, defeated? I mean, this is so sad. And he said, no. She's sailing off like a queen about to claim her territory. And in one week flat, she's going to be the ruler of that, of that hospital. She's going to be in charge of everything mm -hmm. with her charm and her grace and her manners and her determination. So Tennessee Williams even saw Blanche, du Blanche Dubois as a, not a tragic figure, but as in, in her own madness, somebody who who was worthy of a kind of an admiration. Not that my character is mad. Same question to you then. Where are Bree and Toby in 10 years? Well, what do you think? I mean, I don't think that's a question I should answer. I think everybody has their own idea. The mm. I was um, uh, sometimes a little amused when at a couple questions, maybe at festivals or interviewers, I can't remember, uh, said, oh gosh, the end to me was so sad because she has to like, what kind of mother is she or father is she that she has to like praise him for being in a porno movie? I mean, that's just ter you know, tragic. That's horrible. And I said, I would say, are you kidding? She's learned wisdom. She knows that she has to meet him where he is and give him the praise he can accept for what he can accomplish now. But she's building trust and building a relationship with him. For, and, 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 and from there, in my opinion, she's going to help him do whatever, become a veterinarian or go to veterinary assistant school or whatever, help him find his life. She's starting to be a real parent here. People think that the end is the end, but no, the end is always the beginning. You wrote this before you had children. It was predictive, wasn't it? Well, setting aside the, you know, the, the subject matter, or at least the trans subject matter, this is, among other things, a story about a parent learning to parent. And, and could this be construed as your interpretation of what parenting could be? Or, or, or maybe what a child in those uh, maybe uncommon circumstances might need from a parent and Brie learning how to become that? In the end... In the end, it was, it's very much, I have to every day, my kids are teenagers now. I have to uh -huh. every day uh, find, you know, teenagers are so insecure and so, so unsure of themselves, but act like they're, they know everything. Uh -huh. And uh, I have to, like I said, meet them where they are and praise them for what they can accomplish and what they can manage and uh, accept what they can't and know that it'll change and they'll grow. So when they lose their temper or act like assholes, that's okay. Because it's who, what, where they are right now. And I, you know, I can't force them to be 25 when they're 14 and 15. You know, Bree is such an interesting character to me. There are some, let's call them eccentricities that she has that I, I want to talk about. Is Bree's properness, her almost kind of like religious adherence to etiquette, the way she carries herself, the way she speaks... Is that some kind of an affectation that comes from the way you wrote her? Or if that's something that was, you know, built in the way that Felicity portrayed her? I mean, how deliberate was that? It was completely deliberate. When I was interviewing and researching and met, met and befriended a lot of trans women, and, as I, and I went to trans support groups and trans events at the center in New York, and, and I was looking at the wide variety of people there, the ones that I, the, the, as I shaped the story, the one, the, the, the person, that, the character that I wanted to create was drawn from a lot of these women, little bits and pieces here and there. Mm -hmm. And I decided to, to write about a, a woman who wanted to do her, to medicalize her transition, change her sex and, and disappear into the world as, uh, without anybody knowing her gender history. And that was the choice. I made. There's many other trans journeys possible, more now than there were back then, it seems. But uh, as I was writing Brie and I was trying to finding her voice, I was walking around New York City and I knew she was very educated and had gone to all these different schools. And I was just searching for the voice. I was trying this and that. And I, I happened to be walking my dog 
and uh, I was stopped in near NYU at, and there was some like maybe 30 year old woman walking her dog. And at the stoplight, we just talked for about 30 seconds and she never used in that brief time. You, she was like so nerdy and self-conscious and delightful. And she would never use a two syllable word if a four syllable word could fit. And she would, you know, consider her sentences and be very deliberate. You know, she was naturally socially awkward and working through it and being friendly, but it was so self-conscious. And I thought, that's Brie. <laughs> I, just, I just knew it. And I, and I, I, there's a part of me that's like that sometimes too. And I just, mm-hmm. from then on, it just flowed out. And her way of speaking is so deliberate that, you know, Felicity started talking that way during the uh, shooting. She just, it's like, a, it's, a, it was, it was really fun uh, and, and specific. I, I really, I really adored her voice. I really fell in love with Brie as a real person during shooting that, that Felicity brought to life, that my words brought to life, but Felicity brought to life. And, and uh, you know, it was sad to end shooting and sad to end editing because it was like saying goodbye to somebody who seemed alive to me. I, I mean, I actually do see you in Brie. I don't know. I guess it's like all of the scarves and shawls I wear and, uh, and below the knee skirts. <laughs> And, you know, she takes every opportunity to call out all of the annoying little nuances and language and conversation style that I know are probably the same things you take issue with. For instance, using the word like ambiguously in sentence structure or these offhand clever turns of phrase that might, you know, go over most people's heads, but are actually super respectable linguistic call outs. When I say this, does it does it resonate? Well, the linguistic call outs are definitely something that was passed down from my family, my my father was a lawyer, and he sp- and w- he was able to speak ex- uh, extremely clearly, and you know, made his life, you know, in writing contracts about clarity and grammar, and every word counted because if you miswrote a contract, you could, you know, you're in deep trouble. So, you know, that that there the, the family scene in Phoenix, that guy was not my father, but the woman was my mother, and that's a whole other story. But mm. uh, there is a bit taken from life there. And I probably, I, yeah, I got that. I, and I'm that way with my, my kids now too. They, they, they may end up correcting their friends about misuse of words or, you know, when people say like, you know, some of my things, like I used to say uh, mischievously, and my dad would always say, how many eyes are there in mischief, mischievously? <laughs> and, uh, um, but um, I, I took, take, took great my, all my life I was corrected for, if anybody, if I happened to say often, and and my dad would say it's the traditional pronunciation, which is from the British and is only as often has become accepted only in the last 20 years or so, but often is the correct pronunciation. Although now everybody says often, so I'm, so now it's accepted. It sounds, it sounds uneducated to my wor- ears, but it's not uneducated. It's just the language has changed, but I was taught that it was uneducated when I was young. So was this in Brie just an artifact that maybe subconsciously bled into the writing or were you trying to represent yourself a bit? No, I just made, I I pulled things from life here and there. The language thing happens to be from my family, but it also fit in very well with who she was from as I was inventing her. The, uh, I don't know what other qualities I knew that what I know when she, uh, when I, I had told the, you know, when we did costume and makeup, trials before shooting i would describe i described i remember what i wanted in terms of both and and the costume designer who was wonderful would uh buy the same i was just describing you know just catalog bought shirt dresses that are baggy and that button all the way down that conceal more than reveal and and he got the uh uh he chose her palette based on her makeup tone and and he got the same dress in like three different lengths. And I would choose the one that was the more revealing, the more concealing, I mean. And uh, and then they first did her makeup. And I just said, she's not practiced at makeup. And she has, she bought her makeup from a cataloger from Amazon. And she, Amazon, I don't know if it even existed. I can't remember. But she, she uh, so the, 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 the tone is off a shade or two. And maybe she forgets to do it on her neck. And she's just, learning. She's not, it's not that she's ridiculous. It's just that she's not expert yet. And uh, she's in that place. That's wonderful place. It's in between. 
where, she, as Jan Morris wrote in her memoirs, Conundrum, about her transition, she said it was that she thought it was a magical time where she could go into Harrods in London and the doorman outside would be, say, Welcome, ma'am. And she'd pass through the doors and the salesperson inside would say, How may I help you, sir? Oh. And it was, uh, she, she was amused and, 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 and thought it was kind of magical. Other people might be upset by it. But, uh, um, I was, that's the, the sort of place, but you know, she had to more pass as a woman to Toby. So she was, you know, not totally readable, but she was not comfortable yet with her clothes and her, her, the way she wore makeup. And the very end is the first time we see her wear pants mm -hmm. where she, after her surgery, she's actually wearing pants instead of a dress. She has the confidence. They're flowered feminine pants, but she's wearing pants and she's wearing a sleeveless shirt instead yeah. of like a shirt and a scarf and a shawl and a jacket over everything. So, you know, that's, that's her growth. But uh, I think I've digressed from the fundamental question. <laughs> uh, oh, I was going to tell you, it's funny when the makeup tests, they first came out and I told they, they, they just gave it a try and she came out looking like uh, Tammy Faye. How do you say her name? Backer, Baker. Baker. And uh, she looked like Tammy Faye. And, uh, I was, uh, I was like, oh no, way too drag queeny. I mean, she's going for conservative and blending in. She didn't, she doesn't overdo it. If anything, she underdoes it. Uh, so, you know, they turned around and went back and came out and I said, perfect. So, you know, you, you, you work on it together and that's everything I said like that helped Felicity get a handle on the character. To anyone that doesn't know how Transamerica went from, you know, your idea to the Oscars, it, it is fascinating. There is an American dream quality to your story. And I think that your experience is a great response to anyone that says that the likelihood of writing a movie, obtaining financing for that movie, drawing some massive talent into that project, and then not only screening it to a wide audience, but being nominated for and winning many awards, including winning a Golden Globe, winning at Cannes winning at the Berlin International Film Festival, and then the film receiving two Academy Award nominations, one for Felicity Huffman, uh, Best Actress, and one for Original Song for Dolly Parton, Traveling Through, but that, that, that this can't be done, that it's impossible. You know, I, I was a filmmaking major in undergrad for one semester, and, and, and that's the only 4.0 semester I ever had, I think. And I, I don't know if that says more about me or the program, but the point is that I don't know much about making a film and what that process looks like. So to someone like me, what you've done here looks like an enormous accomplishment, uh, a huge feat. And so I guess I'm wondering how that happened. Well, all my life, I would dabbled in various art forms from painting and collage and photography, fine art that you hang on the wall to writing and i just always been in love with stories and uh i never maybe had the courage to put myself out there i did have some success in those various fields and and this really this movie came when i kind of my father had died i was in grief i realized that the life i'd been living with a lot of fabulous creatures in downtown bohemia new york was not a grown-up life that I wanted. They were all wonderful and, like I said, fabulous, but they uh, uh, may be a bit narcissistic here and there. It happens with artists sometimes. And uh, um, I just wanted to change everything. And mm -hmm. out of that, almost as a uh, survival, maybe, I just had to find something that I could be passionate about and get serious about. And I, I asked myself, what do I love most in the world? And they were you know, art with, and especially stories, music, and pictures. Mm -hmm. And I thought, how do I glom those together? And immediately the idea popped up a movie. And then a great deal of fear popped up. Saying, I don't know a damn thing about making movies. And immediately after that, confidence popped up. And I said, but I could do it. Hmm. And uh, so I did it. You know, I read books and I watched a lot of movies and I I would like watch movies I liked over and over with a stopwatch and like, oh, and this is when I learned this. This is when we figure out that, oh, this is the opening image. This is like, oh, this is when the action starts. And I would, you know, just dissect them and find commonalities. And and then uh, I just, I had this idea about the these two 
outsider characters who were sexual and gender outsiders and lonely and lost finding each other and uh and making a family and uh you know it, it took a probably almost a year to just think about and then once i had it figured out also then about oh months and months and months of research and just meeting i i i i found a connection who knew of how to get in touch with various street boys and I had volunteered and taught at the Harvey Milk School in, although I didn't interview any of my students, that would have been completely inappropriate, but I did connect with somebody who was not associated with the school who I would interview these poor lost soul boys and, uh, and I interviewed trans women that took a long while to gain the trust of people in that community at that, at that time, because, you know, these were women who wanted to disappear, who did not want to be outed necessarily and were suspicious and 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 no reason they shouldn't be and from that the story grew and once i had the uh once i'd done all of that then i wrote the screenplay and uh i think it took six or eight months to write the screenplay and uh, first to get a draft i was satisfied with so you have this script and then what you have to shop it around right or or did you have an open door somewhere well the first Mr. Uh, the first thing was I had the script and then I, you know, you you need to get it up, not on its feet, but you need to hear it read. You need to hear it out loud. So there was this thing called the New York Poets Cafe on, in the East Village in New York that was back in the day that was like cool and hip and like above my pay grade, I thought, but I was trying to get it. I wanted, that was a cool thing. And I was nobody in that world of screenwriting. So I submitted it because I thought it was pretty good. And this person I was acquainted with who was a, uh, producer and had made a couple of movies. I don't really know what ever happened to her. Nice woman, Diana, um, had encouraged me to, and then they rejected it. And I told her, oh, well, I did, got rejected. Uh, I guess I need to work on it more. And she said, let me talk to them. I know them. And I, she talked to them and I guess persuaded them. And I got a call and they scheduled it and agreed to read it, so have it read. So I contacted these very legit good actors who were supporting actors on Broadway or leads off Broadway and L- L- Uta Hagen's protege, Red Bree. And, and, uh, and we sat down and, re- and, and they read it and, uh, you know, all these cool, like beaten it, cool bohemians sitting at their tables, drinking wine and, and listening to the actors on stage around the table, read it. And, uh, funny, it was like on a Friday night, I guess. And then I think it was a three day weekend. And, and, uh, the uh, next Monday or Tuesday, I got a uh, a call from the people who ran ran the screenplay series, and they were like, "We came into work today, and both of our answering machines were full. We can't. We've never gotten this response in our lives. This is and, and in our whole thing. This is like everybody loved it. This was like I, we're so sorry. We didn't like. I didn't get. You know, this is what it ran into over and over again. People didn't get it." People didn't get it. Is it a comedy? Is it a drama? What's the tone? I don't get it. Is it, you know, is it, they think trans movie, they thought it was, is it John Watersy? Is it, mm. you know, they just didn't have a clue. And, and so often they didn't get it. And and then, and then once it got made or once they saw it, somehow they got it or the audiences got it. Um, you know, Harvey Weinstein who bought it, didn't get it. He thought it was going to disappear in three weeks and he, and, uh, and he was going to, he offered such low money for it, but I had box office bonuses and, and I had faith that I would make money. And I did make those box office bonuses. Although the son of a bitch, when, uh, it was nearing, I was going to get a major bonus in six figures when it was, uh, reached $10 million in the box office. And, and at, when it was approaching $10 million, this is just for domestic box office grossness. The, the, uh, uh, it was the highest per screen average aver, per screen average making money making movie out in America hmm. the highest earning per screen movie in America and it was approaching a 10 million mark and he pulled it from theaters <laughs> rather than have to pay me that he's such a he was r- really a homophobic creep uh um and also he you know he didn't care about he just cared about the bottom line he didn't care about art but, you know, I think it would have made his money back if he'd given it a little bit of advertising and a little bit of a push. It was sure just growing and growing from having no advertising, no promotion whatsoever, no TV, nothing on newspapers, nothing. He really thought it was just a, a queer movie that would go into the out-of-the-way theaters and a few gay people would see it and then it would die. 
But anyway, our first strategy, Sean, was to uh, to uh, once uh, once I got it on his feet. Oh yeah, I after that first reading, I realized, oh my god, you know, in this last half of the movie, I start to feel really bad for Bree. It's like I need to give her something. You know, she's having such a hard time, and I I didn't even have the Calvin Many Goats character in there at all, and I. I just thought, okay, when the car is stolen, something's got to, I got to give her something. And I, I wrote his handful of scenes in about 20 minutes. I knew her so well. I knew who he was. First draft, never changed it. And uh, I just knew it. It was by the time you know your characters, you, it just flows out. So I uh, did a second reading for producers, a few different producers who'd done some interesting little indie movies. I invited them, they came. Uh, at like anthology film archives or some place like that, that I, I they gave me the room, and uh, they all were interested. I chose the ones that I got along with the most, as kind of for hire producers to le- be to do the logistics and get the everything going and 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 maintain it all because I didn't know how the, the mechanics of making a movie, how to find the right people, etc. And then our strategy was to try to cast a famous actress who could on whose name we could raise money. So I, you know, I always had Felicity in mind because I admired her so much from her off-Broadway theater work that I knew with Dave Mamet, but I, she wasn't a name then. And, uh, and people who I offered it to like Alice and Janney and Frances McDormand and Emma Thompson, and Tilda Swinton, and I don't know who else, uh, they all said no. And I don't blame them at all because, uh, you know, a, a dangerous, chancy script that, was a the role could make them look like idiots if it was an untalented director and they chose projects that were sure things and i and and uh a director makes or break the movie but felicity who from the theater did, didn't wasn't getting lead leading role offers wanted to meet me and i flew out and stayed with her and bill macy and spent three or four days there and she saw that i wasn't an idiot and uh and had some good ideas. I had even a collage book that I'd made that showed characters and landscapes and scenes and loca- locations and houses and interiors that were just a vision book or whatever for the movie. And and it was it's a nice book uh, um, that I made, and that impressed her. And and so uh, um, she agreed to do it. And once that happened, I know I just had to pay for it myself. I told. I maxed out credit cards. I mortgaged a little house I had. I borrowed money from family. I got the most money I could together. And I said to the producers, can we make it for this amount of money? And they said, they did some calculation. And they said, we can just manage. She said, they said, you might not be able to hire any department heads like costume or makeup or director or photography that you ever heard of. Who knows? They might even be recent film school graduates. Um, but I said, well, let's give it a shot. And they and when we started hiring again, it's like you get to the artist level, the craftsman level, and everybody who was my first choice from costumes to art direction to c- cinematographer, the first choice all wanted to do it. And once uh, Felicity was on board and we were greenlit, every single actor I went to from Fanula Flanagan to Graham Green, they were all my, f- Burt Young, they were all my first choices. And they all said yes. Um, the kid I was, I saw every kid around the country who had an agent. I was, you know, hundreds of kids and I couldn't find it. You know, I actually uh, met Joseph Gordon Levitt before he made Mysterious Skin and I wanted him. And I, I was actually going to do it with him and Juliet Stevenson, but then there, we had a financial problem with what Juliet needed and, and uh, it was all put on pause and I hadn't formally offered to him yet. And, and, then when I got Felicity, I went back to ask about Joseph and he, Joey, it was, he went by then and, and he'd accepted mater- mysterious skin. And I was like, damn. So I, you know, I found this kid who was the, uh, Kevin Zegers and who I was reluctant to cast because he was too pretty, but I thought, but in any case, and then, you know, it all took off from then. And it was like a train r- flowing downhill, uh, running downhill. It was like a runaway train. You couldn't stop it. And everything started coming together from, uh, the locations we use were look because we were on a suddenly we were going full speed ahead. I didn't have time to leisurely scout for locations, so I used places I knew: a friend's house, my mother's house, uh, a road I knew in upstate New York, uh, 
you know, whatever. Um, you know, this was a guerrilla movie when she's a little scene where she's going up the steps to the police department or, or the jail, whatever in New York city. Um, we didn't get permits or anything. We just like quick shoot it, go up the steps, <laughs> shoot it out the car. <laughs> so, um, you know, it was, it was, it was, fun and kind of edge of your seat filmmaking. You mentioned the cast and it's worth re-mentioning how much of a powerhouse cast this was. I mean, obviously Felicity Huffman, who would do Desperate Housewives almost kind of simultaneously with Transamerica. You mentioned Burt Young, who was Polly in Rocky. Uh, Fanula Flanagan, who played Bree's mother. Uh, she was in Divine Secrets of the Yaya Sisterhood and Waking Dead Divine. Carrie Preston, who played Bree's sister. She was in True Blood, The Good Wife, Graham Greene, who was in The Green Mile, Dances with Wolves. He's also in the TV series 1883. I mean, this is a powerhouse cast. And, and, and so knowing that you also financed this film yourself, I mean... I, every penny I had and could get my hands on, yeah, that's pretty much how a lot of first-time filmmakers end up doing it. And uh, I don't know about now, but back then it's like, Who's going to pay for your movie if you're nobody? Uh, you got to do it yourself. You, I wonder how uh, a movie like what was uh, was Wes Anderson's first movie, Bottle Rocket? I wonder how his that got financed. You mentioned the soundtrack earlier, and, I, and I've told you this before, but the Transamerica soundtrack singularly taught me how important a good soundtrack is to a movie, how essential the music is to the mood and the environment. And, and much like casting, this is a phenomenal soundtrack. Old Crow Medicine Show, this, this movie made me a fan of theirs. Um, David Mansfield, Larry Sanders, Nitty Gritty Dirt Band, who had one of the best albums of all time with Will the Circle Be Unbroken, Duncan Sheik, Lucinda Williams, and, and, and of course Dolly Parton, who was nominated for an Oscar for her original song here, Traveling Through. Uh, I, I mean... Well, Nitty Gritty Dirt Band was a sentimental favorite. It's the first concert I ever saw. I didn't even know that music concerts existed. And I was like 16 or 17 or something. And a friend of mine in high school said, do you want to go to a concert? And I'm like, what's a concert? And uh, <laughs> I was such a nerd. And uh, so we went to see Nitty Gritty Dirt Band in Kansas City at the old Crow, no, the old Cowtown Ballroom, I think it was called. And uh, I thought it was so cool. And they were so cool. And it was so much fun. And and uh, and I liked them for some years because of circle be will a circle be unbroken and a few of their earlier songs so i knew those two one of the songs that i used by them and i you know you have a a music director who's like a lawyer who gets and feeds you material and also tries to contact the lawyers for uh singers songwriters bands to get you the rights and the problem is that they contact for an independent film an artist like uh, Doc Watson. I wanted a couple of songs by Doc Watson. And uh, and the lawyer, you know, you're offering $1,000 basically for the rights to a song to use in your movie because you can't afford, I can't afford more. So mostly the lawyers don't even answer because, you know, their cut of that is nothing. And uh, um, so they have, they're too busy. They don't want to deal with it. They got a lot of clients. I'm not going to bother. They're not going to bother their clients. So I, you get a lot of no responses. But then you get some responses. Lucinda Williams, who knew? It's like, you know, she liked the, the screenplay, liked the idea. And she was like, a yes. And I was like, I was thrilled because I love Lucinda Williams. And uh, Nitty Gritty Dirt Band were no longer quite so famous, although I, I, I loved their, their material. And, and uh, they gave us two songs and they were thrilled to be part of it. And Jeff Hanna, and, uh, they, he was like, call me on the phone. And he was a great guy. And he's like, oh, this is so cool. And uh Duncan Sheik was a friend of mine, and I just asked him to do a, a sing a song. He did. Um, he recorded it for me, and I don't know what other. I knew it was going to be country music from the get go because it was a story about two typical normal Americans. That's the whole thing. There's always people pointing at the outsider, saying they're different, but we're all in it together, right? And th th so I wanted to ground the story of these people who who in other movies might be, be portrayed as freaks or outsiders or weirdos and ground them in the heart of America. And one way to emphasize that is by making the soundtrack, the music of the heart of America. 
And as they traveled from a slightly hip hop sounding New York to a uh, through the South Appalachians and the more Nashville sound to the West where there's Native American and Latino and cowboy music. I mean, the music kind of shifts as, uh, uh, as the landscape shifts. And no shade to anyone else that contributed to the music, but I mean, Dolly Parton, for, for, for a first time filmmaker, this, this is almost like a coup. Like, how did that happen? Well, Harvey had bought the movie. We were showing it at all festivals with one of the Nitty Gritty Dirt Band songs as a pickup song for the end credits. And when I, William Morris was representing me and I had a meeting and it was before the movie was released and, and before I'd really gone to too many festivals and I was in the middle of going to festivals and, uh, and my, one, one of my top, you know, of an agent team, one of the top agents said, well, what can we do for you? What, and is there anything we can do right now? And I said, yeah, I want, would love to have an end credits original song. And they said, who do you want? And I said, I really want Dolly Parton. I've been thinking about this for a while. She's a symbol of self-transformation and survival and joy, and she's just right for it. And they said, well, that's a big ask, but you know, I, they knew her manager and they'd get it to his desk. And uh, they called me back within some days and said that she can't do it because she's on tour with her new album and she's too busy. And I said, oh, well. And uh, then within uh, some days more, I can't remember the timetable, I got a CD in the mail and it, there was a note from Dolly who said, I wrote you a song. And I put it on. It was fully produced, backup singers, orchestrated, et cetera. And she wrote the song and it was a really great song, but it wasn't quite the right, what I needed, you know, movies are very specific and you need a certain feel that, that, that on, on, as you're going out, you want to know, I knew how I wanted to leave the audience and what the energy of the story was. And, and the song wasn't quite right. So I, I wrote her back and a letter of appreciation and told her what sort of song I needed. And said, you know, I think, I know I said like a song that you can sing in revival tents and, and praise the Lord with, but also a song that you can dance to. And, uh, and it's about the journey going ever on. And as you learn and grow and, 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 uh, I thought I'd never hear from her again. And this is actually a great story. I was in, I was in Detroit at a festival and you're doing interviews, radio, television, newspapers, and, and then there's the, uh, maybe a down some downtime, and then you have to show up for the festival to introduce the film and do a Q and A, and they keep you so busy. And then the next morning, you fly out to the next festival. And uh, um, I got a telephone call, and it was Dolly's office, and they said, "Dolly wrote you another song, and we want to get it to you, uh, or to want you." And, and I'm like, "Oh God, I'm in Detroit, but I'm flying flying tomorrow. How? When could?" It? And and they're like, they interrupt me and said, "Dolly's in Detroit on tour." And I said, you're kidding. I mean, this is exactly the kind of typical magic story. Transamerica has so many of these. And I said, I'm, 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 I'm free only between five and six. That's like the only time I have free. And they said, Dolly is in like dress and tech rehearsals, but she's only free between five and six. And I said, give me the address, you know? And I have this black car that they're driving me around from interview to interview on station to station on. And I told the driver to drive me to the theater downtown where Dolly was performing. And they drove me there. And in the back of the theater was her lavender tour bus. And uh, I'm like, oh, wow, I'm going to meet Dolly Parton. And I go in there and she's, you know, looks like Dolly Parton. She's got her casual hair on with some chopsticks in it and fluffing up and, you know, her red velvet capri pants and bustier. And she looks fabulous. And she couldn't have been nicer. Exactly what you'd picture. She's fluffing my pillows and getting me water and being totally hospitable. And, and, and she's got like nails out to, for miles. And, uh, and she picks up her guitar and has the words written out by hand on a legal pad. And she says like, okay, now I'm going to sing you this song, but like, don't be too judgmental on me because I, I just finished writing it last night and I, I, I might not have it right. Exactly. I might make a mistake. And I'm like, are you kidding? I'm, 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 I'm here to listen, but go for it. And, and, uh, and she played it and I really liked it, but I was <laughs> so shameless, I guess. I was like, 
practically vibrating when she finished. I said, Dolly, it's great. It's great. It's great. And she said, well, I'm so happy. I said, but <laughs> can we change a few things? Can we take this part that you do in the end and then put it every other verse, kind of like chorus, verse, chorus, verse? Because I love that, 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 that thing, but you said it to the end. And she goes, well, I'll give it a shot. And I'm like, and also, could you like, toward the end, could you take that part that I'm talking about and just cut it down to half time and, and stop, put down your guitar and sing an acapella, kind of like gospel? Uh, well, I'll give that a shot too. And, uh, and she went through it another time or two for me. And, and by the time I finished meeting with her, she and I were total buddies. She liked me. She liked my ideas. She invited me the following week. She said, oh, I could detour the tour bus to Nashville for like three days and we could lay down the song, but I want you to be there. I can only do it if you'll be there because I want to make sure you get what you want. That's a real professional, right? Not like I'm an artist and I will do what I feel is right. But somebody who knows how to collaborate. I and uh, I arranged on my own dime. I didn't tell Harvey any of this, and uh, uh, flew there. And I, she said, "All I want is for the musicians to be paid union scale, and it was going to be like eight hundred bucks for a day, you know, and uh, uh, two hundred dollars each or something like that." And uh, I said, "I'll pay for it if, if Harvey won't. Don't worry about it. Let's just do it." And uh, and so she we went. I had a great time. I was up till. Two in the morning after all the musicians had gone home and just the guy who operated the Starship controls of the music produ production and I and, and Dolly were there and she's in the sound booth, the vocalist booth with the headphones and singing in the mic and laying in some background vocals and uh, counterpoint and, and, and some chants. I wanted it to have kind of an African sound because the first song in the movie is African. So I just wanted these little hint of Africa and she didn't know much about African music. She was like, I don't know how to sing native chants, but I'll give it a whirl. And at one point, I'm pushing the button so she can hear me. And I'm going like, hey, Dolly, try this. Try going something like, ah, or some crazy thing. And she said, I, then I pushed it again. I said, oh, my God, I can't believe I'm singing to Dolly Parton. And she said, don't worry, Duncan, that ain't singing. <laughs> so um, um, anyway, that was great. I ended up being her date at the Oscars. and. Uh, she was way too busy to campaign for, you have to do a lot of campaigning and polit politicizing for Oscars. And uh, I wish she'd won, but she didn't. Uh, but it was, I think it's one of her best songs, actually. I think it's a great song. That's that story. Campaigning during awards season, if Harvey wasn't on board or, or committing the resources to promote Transamerica, how did you navigate that minefield? Well, the there is, you know, you know how there used to be political bosses who would like trade for votes? They'd get like, get your union to vote for us and I will make sure that your workers get a five cent per hour raise or something like that. And, or, you know, they, there's a lot of horse trading for votes for Oscars or like vote for our nominee and we will give three of your clients major supporting parts in movies. Um, in the next two years, or, you know, that not, not everybody who's an Academy member sees all the movies every single damn year, especially now, how many movies are nominated every year? 12? Believe me, like, you know, the, the some of the uh, more seasoned people, Jack Nicholson is not going to be sitting down watching 12 movies that he's not necessarily interested in. And they, t I'm not, I'm just, it's just like, it's not, it's, it's just business. So yeah, without any advertising or billboards, which are very important, or Harvey could promote, but he didn't. I kept saying, Harvey, you're talking about Felicity's performance all the time because she's a desperate housewife. And yes, now she's a household name. She didn't used to be. So that's a great thing to capitalize on. Here I am, like not knowing anything, but lecturing Harvey, but I didn't give a shit. And because uh, I just didn't care. I love my movie. And I, I'm not like, I wasn't in the movie business. Like I was afraid of Harvey Weinstein. He was just a big pushy guy. But any, the, uh, I said, you got to communicate that it's a fun movie. If people think it's a downer or, you know, from your advertising, from your posters, they think that it's some sad slog of a movie, they're not going to see it. So yeah, emphasize Felicity, but emphasize that it's a co comedy. Well, no comedies ever win awards. Well, then, you know, what a, a comedy drama. Look at Terms of Endearment. You laugh, you cry. But he didn't know how to do it and he wouldn't do it and he was pissed off at the movie in general, because it was outperforming the two movies that he'd produced that year that he'd put millions into. 
and uh, with no advertising and sheer word of mouth, you know, blood, this is again, the Transamerica runaway train. It's like, maybe I'm switch gears in an earlier part. Like when I had a rough cut of the movie and I'd shown it to various friends or people I could draft to get some feedback and to help me bring a clear eye. And I could, if, if, if somebody said something in those early days and it resonated with something I already kind of knew, but hadn't quite admitted to myself, it was a change that I was more likely to make and editing, you're creating the movie again. So in any case, I thought it was pretty good. We set the rough cut in um, and uh, to Sundance, because that's what you think. It's an independent movie. You want to send it to go to Sundance. That's where you go. And uh, we got word back some weeks later that we were not accepted into Sundance. And I was so dejected. I thought, I thought this was a pretty good movie. This is so sweet. I was like delighted looking at it on as as we were putting it together and I looking looking at this cut it this is pretty good I don't get it did I really make a piece of junk and and uh not good enough for Sundance which god knows doesn't always have the best movies and uh I was really sad and then about a, a few weeks later we got a letter from uh Berlin Film Festival which is way more important than Sundance sorry Sundance and uh we got in and maybe we wouldn't have gotten in if we were at Sundance cuz Berlin likes to have premieres and then we won, you know, I didn't know. I was like shown into the final award ceremonies and I'm seated in like the, whatever, the third or fourth row center next to somebody and I'm introduced to him and he's the famous gay mayor of Berlin. And I'm like, oh, they're sitting me next to the mayor. That's interesting. And they do this because, you know, they're televising it locally and they want to get him in next to somebody who they knew was going to win an award. I didn't know I was going to win an award. And we won the jury award for best film. And, you know, after that, I was like, like three or four days after, I, we couldn't pull people in to see our movie. The, I mean, executives from LA who were in the acquisitions departments, the, uh, the audiences swelled in our four screenings in like six or seven or 800 seat theaters to the point where they were like crowding the aisles, sitting on the aisles five deep in the back of the theater standing. I don't know how the fire marshals allowed it, but uh, in any case, uh, the, the audience reaction was incredible. But finally, one of my producers cornered an acquisitions agent from one of the major studios, an acquisitions vice president, and said, uh, you've got to come see our movie. It's getting great response. And it's, I think you should see it. It's really good. And he said, I'm sorry, I'm here to do business and acquire movies. I'm not going to come see your tranny movie. And, you know, they looked at it and they just didn't, again, people didn't get it. And, uh, and then we won the award. And then some days later, Variety reviewed us because they'd been there at the Berlin Film Festival. And it was a review that you'd sell your grandchildren for um, and said it was great. And suddenly everybody was knocking on our door. We want to see your movie. We want to see your movie. And, uh, and on the advice, uh, talking to our lawyer and talking to William Macy and others, they said, don't show it to him. Let him see it at the audi with the audience because it's always better to see in a movie with an audience um, at our next uh, festival, which was Tribeca. And at Tribeca, a lot of people were interested in the movie. And that's where Harvey Weinstein, they kept saying, he doesn't go to festivals. He doesn't go to audience screenings. He's not going to go. And, and uh, everybody kept telling me, stand fast. Don't show it to him then. You know, and I was maybe cocky or maybe confident enough about my movie. I just, it was our final screening and my lawyer was on the phone. He was upset and trying to get there. I'm on the phone with them and he, they, they, he with Harvey's office and he's, he's like whispering to me, he says, they're, they say he's not coming. He's not coming. And shit, he's not coming. Cause he was an important possibility for acquiring the movie. And as he's saying, he's not coming, he's not coming. I look at the escalator coming up to the screening room floor and I said, he's coming. <laughs> Cause there he was. Surrounded by a bunch of like hovering gnats who were his people who were taking calls and circle and being his, you know, little entourage. And he's pissed off, but he comes in and he sees the audience reaction and he offered on it. So again, the, you know, I don't know, the little engine that could. This movie was so unconventional and non-traditional in so many ways, from the filmmaking process itself to the story. And, and yet we, we see how it punched above its weight. What is it about this movie you think that so resonates with people? I think it's because everybody knows what it's like to feel like an outsider. The fact of the matter is that whoever you are, you know, Cindy Crawford or some famous, you know, Kim Kardashian or something like that, inside themselves, they feel like an outsider, lonely freak. Everybody, it's just the human condition. 
that we all are, 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 are alone in this world. Nobody totally, totally unconditionally understands us and loves us always and forever. And so everybody resonates with the story about an outsider. Plus you get to laugh and you get to see something that you haven't seen before. You know, when, when, when during that Sundance period, when the rough cut was going out, something that helped me feel better was, uh, one day my phone rang and they're just, I don't know how she got it. I think I never, but anyway, the phone rang and, and, and I answered my cell and, and, uh, and I said, hello. And the voice said, hello, I'd like to speak to Mr. Duncan Tucker. And I said, this is he, who, who's this? I'm thinking it's some kind of sales thing. And the voice says, Mr. Tucker, this is Bette Midler. And I just, I know, I'm sorry, but I saw a copy of your movie and I just want to tell you it's fabulous. you can call me Duncan (laughs) and Bet took me out to lunch and she was full of Jewish mother advice and she was so warm and sweet and lovable and uh, I just loved her Um, it was crazy it was like and then the movie came out and every actress of a certain age you know because I wrote I directed a movie with a mature woman which there aren't enough parts for mature women and uh and uh, so every actress uh, of a certain age wanted to meet with me. So I would get calls from my agent, at, uh, things like I'm in New York briefly, and they're saying, um, "We just our office has got a call. Do you want to, by any chance, do you want to have lunch with Cher tomorrow?" <laughs> like, <laughs> sure. Oh, no thanks. <laughs> so, I, you know, and it's like you go to the hotel and you're asking. Uh, I would, you know, you have to ask for whatever. I can't remember what her name was, like Olive Oil or Wilma Flintstone or something. <laughs> you know, it's a, oh no, her name was Rosetta Stone. That was it. <laughs> really? Wait, so you did, you had lunch with her? Yeah. And she was great too. She's, you know, smart and she's actually very self-protective. You know, these people who have been through like Dolly, like Cher, that have been through the tabloids and their lives exposed and, and they feel kind of, it's kind of a violation, right? And they can't make a move. They are sensitive people, you know, to be famous doesn't necessarily mean you're insensitive. And, and, you know, when you get through and you win their trust and, and they let their hair down with you, it's like, you know, you see the human being underneath it. And, um, I, I got great stories, uh, uh, from Cher. Uh, she was delightful. <laughs> so, t- so tell me a story and, and it, it doesn't have to be a share story. You know, there's a story that I always tell that I, you should know that I think this is a funny story or a good story and you can fit it in or not. But, uh, when, you know, when I wrote the scene in the original, in, in the original, well, in the, in the screenplay, when I wrote the scene in the screenplay about, uh, uh where, okay, I'm going to start this again so you can use it. <laughs> when I wrote the scene in the screenplay, in which uh, Bree is is needing to take a, a rest stop by the highway, and it's, they can't find a bathroom, and she 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 pees outside, and Toby glimpses uh, her body. I didn't know how I was going to shoot it. I figured, you know, shadow or turned away, but we just see from Toby's expression. It's like I'd figure it out on the day. And uh, and as we were filming, and I saw how complete the performance was, and how real Bree was as a character, as a person that the greatest act of love I could do for her out of respect for her was to show the truth of what she was, what her body was to show because how intimate we're getting, we're so intimate with her. Why not be intimate with her whole self, including her body? So I asked Felicity if she'd be willing, if we could get a prosthetic penis. And she said, yes, because she's a brave actor. And, uh, and then I talked to my producers and I said, where can we get a prosthetic penis that can pee? And they said, well, call the special effects houses. And they called a few and they let me know later that day that the quote was like $10,000 for it from two different effects houses. And I said, I can't afford that. And, uh, but Felicity wore as part of her acting thing, she had this, this sort of perfect, nicely shaped, but just basically bland, flesh colored, rubbery penis and testicle thing that she wore in her panties so she would know what Brie was dealing with. And I knew that she had that. It was, and, and it was, it had a nickname. I can't remember what it was called, but anyway, I said, can we look at that for a second? And I took it to um, props and I said to the prop guy, who's just one guy, props is one guy. I said, uh, Duke, can you make this uh, possibly drill a hole in it or something and make it so it can pee? 
And he was like, yeah, no problem. I could just drill a hole through it and put a plastic tube through it and connect it to a hot water bottle under her arm. And she could just press on the hot water bottle. And there you go. Put some yellow food color in. And I said, okay, great. And I took it to the makeup department, who's two women. And I, I said, can you guys make this look more real? And like, so like it's breeze. And they're like, yeah, I mean, it's just put her foundation on it and paint a few suggestions of veins and it's done and a little shadowing. And I'm like, okay, let's go for it. And, uh, on the, on the, uh, we were in the middle of nowhere on that night and the deliver the made up th thing with its apparatus is delivered to this little trailer. It was like a junkie trailer. We had the only trailer and, uh, um, Felicity goes into the bathroom, the tiny little accordion door, you know, tiny bathroom to hold it up against herself and see how it looks. And, and, and I'm outside the bathroom and I just hear like, oh my God. And her little, her assistant is with her and I hear another, oh my God. And then a pause and Felicity's voice says, Duncan, I think you should come in here. And I came in and closed the door behind me and she lifted up her skirt and showed it to me, held up against herself. And I'm looking at, oh my God, because even from a foot away, two feet away, it looked completely real. It, for, for, for zero dollars, basically, for five dollars for the hot water bottle and plastic tubing. And this is why Hollywood movies budgets are crazy, because you can do this stuff more easily than you think. Anyway, she was so brave. And it was and and uh, and just before we shot it, I just see, saw how upset she was when she saw that reality. And, and I just said, Felicity, you want to talk, come with me and can we talk? And and I just said, so what are you feeling? And she just started to sob. And I the human being in me wanted to go and comfort her because you want to comfort a crying person. But the director in me knew that she was feeling what Brie feels and processing the emotion of what Brie was going through. And I, I, I just sat there and let her cry. And she, I think she got that I got it. And, and uh, that from that, that was about halfway through the shoot. And from then on, even more than before, she knew I had her back and she was like, you know, no matter how high fly a ball I would throw to try to get her to try something, she would jump for it. And she was amazing. But it was like that moment of, uh, of trust built between her and, and her incredible courage for the role. So kudos. And you should also know that we tried very hard to find a trans actor for the main role. And act, trans actors with agent, with any visibility, with anybody we could find that were just... You know, I had a hard enough time finding any trans women who would even talk to me back then. I don't know. We didn't find, we didn't, I found somebody just after I'd cast Felicity or about the same time. I can't remember the exact timing. She had a stage experience and is a not a good actress, but, but I, I had no film experience. She had no film experience. Felicity was a veteran with film and television and I'd already cast her and I, I would have to have flown her from Chicago and met her and it was already in the ball was already going. And I just thanked her so much. She was wonderful. And I, you know, it was too late, but it was what it was. So let's talk about, you haven't really produced anything since Transamerica. Yes, I have. Like what? Three kids. You think that Transamerica <laughs> was a challenge. You're hard. You try raising three kids. You try being me right now with three adolescents alone in the house with three adolescents I basically duck and cover and uh, most, uh, and, and then occasionally have to confront them and lay down the law. And then I'm really machine gunned. Ugh. So. Okay. 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 But a uh, frying pan fire, but th this does fly in the face of conventional wisdom that you would leverage all those nominations and those wins into your next, you know, bigger and better project, but you didn't. And I, I, I mean, maybe you just answered the question, but why? I was offered stuff. My, I would literally, I would be offered stuff or I was also writing something and I would literally like, like for the first year, I just was saying, no, I need to be with my baby and my then babies. And then, and, uh, and then I was ready, ready to start take meetings. And, 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 you know, I had no idea being from New York and not a movie person that how quickly your yesterday's news in Hollywood, but nonetheless, I was offered a lot of things. Um, back then they really didn't know what to do. The straight people didn't know what to do with a queer filmmaker. So they were like thinking of me for studio projects that were like Disney movies or romantic comedies or women's movies, such what they called women's movies, which were often romantic comedies. And, you know, those disposable things that would star, you know, 
I don't even Kate Hudson and the the before he was a famous actor Matthew McConaughey. You know, and they if they couldn't get those two, they'd get another pair. And if they couldn't get those two, they, you know, they get Sarah Jessica Parker and some somebody else. It didn't matter. They were just they told me the business model was that they make them. It costs twenty million or thirty million to make and ten million to promote, and it's going to make seventy million at the box office, and it's going to play for four weeks, and and that's an easy, quick twenty or thirty million dollars in the studio's pocket. That's the business model. They're not going to take any risks. They're not going to cast an older person or an unusual person. It's it's just a product. It's a business model. And, uh, you know, I wasn't interested in that stuff, but I still, there were a few interesting things, but I had to say no, because my kid, my daughter would be crying and needing me or, um, my kids were so fierce and they still are that they would like nannies would literally run out of the house. Like, Mary Poppins or something, you know, it's like they would, I have a doctorate degree in child development and I've been taking children, care of children for 20 years and I've never met three children like yours. <laughs> <laughs> I'm kind of proud of my children, but that's literally what happened. And, uh, and also they just needed me. I mean, I could put up with them and I could, they knew who their dad was and I, it tore my heart out. But I had to say no. I had to walk, move away from LA and knew, know that I wasn't going to be making movies. I, I thought I could do both. I thought raising children would be like me sitting in my library working at my next script. And then there, there would be a knock on the door. Father, may I have a few minutes of your time? Certainly, son. Come in and I'll dispense some wisdom. Well, I mean, now that they're older, do you, do you think you have another movie in you? Yeah, like when I have a few quiet days... I have a, an idea or more than one idea, but there's one in particular I'm working on. And when I have a few quiet days and I'm at peace, suddenly my mind just goes goes to it where I can, you know what, we talked about Felicity's character and I, I had to feel her and know her and love her. And the same with all my other characters. I had to know what her voice sounded like and what she'd talk about and what she knew about and what her feelings were and what Toby's were and what everybody's were. And I am incapable of holding all of those lives in my heart and mind at the same time as holding my three kids' lives in my heart and mind. Plus, when my three kids are treating me like target practice and they have Uzis. Um, so if I have some calm days, I start to work on it. But I never have more than three lucky calm days in a row. So I don't know. I would love to maybe direct something fun and light for television if that could happen here. I don't know how the British television hiring works. I have to make some connections. And I would like to write again. The, the hardest part isn't writing. The hardest part is the entire uphill push. It's exhausting to make a movie. You know, you just have to like, oh my God, we have to get this pickup shot of the main character knocking on the door and it opening. And like you're driving an hour to get to the location just to get this one damn shot. And it's like, oh my God, I have better things to do. <laughs> But, you know, it takes a lot. I don't know. We'll see. If you fall in love with your story and your characters enough, you can do anything. Final question. What's something interesting you've been watching or reading lately? And can I say you cannot say Russian now? Okay, Ezra Klein. Compliment. Um, I'll take it. Although I don't like, uh, the, I haven't, I, I watched the, don't put this on. Okay, so here I took out pretty much everything interesting he just said, and it was great. Um. I don't watch. I don't watch. I don't know. I, I mean, I was enjoying How Music Works by David Byrne. That was kind of interesting. I was, uh, um... Oh, my God. Did you not prepare for this question? Not at all. Um, you know, so much of what I read has to do with, like... I, you know, I'm actually reading, although slow... I'm, I, I can kind of go away from it. I'm reading Francis Fukuyama's Political Order and Political Decay. <laughs> <laughs> because of the whole Ukraine situation. It's actually fascinating. But uh, I, I discovered Georgette Heyer, her romantic comedies a la Jane Austen, and they are delightful. They're literate romantic comedies, but very clever. And I can't believe people haven't been making those into movies or a TV series because they're, 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 they're where popular fiction and literature intersect somehow. And uh, they're, they're, they're not quite literature, but they're at the very top rung of pop fiction. Oh, I loved Doctor Who season five and six. <laughs> I never got into that show. Well, I the only seasons I like are the ones with Matt Smith in it. And 
of the episodes that he was in, I although you have to kind of watch them all because they tell an overarching story, 50% of them are really good. And the other 25% are pretty good. And the other 25% might be awful. Okay, Duncan. Sean. I'm going to, I'm going to say, I'm going to say thank you to you. And you're going to say thank you back. And then I'm going to stop recording, but we can still chat a bit more. Okay, let's take one. Okay. Uh, Duncan, thank you so much for uh, chatting with me. I had a lot of fun. Fuck you. <laughs> oh, I miss it up. Try it again. <laughs> take two. Duncan, thanks for being here. I really enjoyed chatting with you. Do we have to say this? Can't we say something fun like? Hasta la vista, dude. Or I'll be back. Or ciao. Well, you just said them, so I can edit all those in. <laughs> <laughs> ciao, bello. Ciao, bello. <laughs> Grazie, Giovanni. Um, okay. Okay, here's you had your things. Hey, thanks, Sean. It was great talking to you, too. Okay, there you have it. Something light and also thought-provoking. And maybe the main takeaway here is, listen, a lot of luck goes into this, but you shouldn't just give up on a dream if you think the odds are stacked against you. I mean, there probably is a pretty good chance that your movie will not be made, but Duncan is proof that there is at least some tiny chance that your movie might be Oscar-nominated and that you might be taking Dolly Parton as your date. All right, this Friday on the second episode of my special Pride Month week, I'm talking to Marty Moore, the executive director of Out Boulder County in Colorado, about the state of queer rights in the United States today, the work that they do, and how anyone can help. Chat soon, folks.